Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our guest is one of the most hardworking and beloved actresses whose body of work spans every genre and every medium. She co-starred in two of the most beloved Broadway shows in history, Fiddler on the Roof and Grease, earning a Tony nomination and a Theater World Award. She played B. Arthur's daughter, Carol, in the hit TV series, Maud, and since then, she's wowed us on the big screen in The Fog, Escape from New York, Cannonball Run, Argo, and many more. On television, you've seen her in Gotham Girls, The Drew Carey Show, Dexter, Carnival, Revenge, Sons of Anarchy, General Hospital, AJ and the Queen, and dozens more hit shows, all of which I've seen. She's also starred in over 25 theatrical productions across North America, including the national tour of Pippin in the USA and the Netherlands. And if that weren't enough, she's written four best-selling books. I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome Adrienne Barbeau to our show. Adrienne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian, I have to tell you, because I've been a huge fan of yours from the beginning, I read your first book, There Are Worse Things I Could Do, when it first came out in 2006. And I was amazed to discover that as career driven and prodigious as you were in your work, I mean, you have over 450 screen performances to your credit. You did not put your career front and center in your book. It's a very personal memoir about your journey to healing and growth and inner contentment. That was a big surprise for me. It's not the typical Hollywood memoir. Oh, well, thank you. I hadn't read many, so I don't know what to compare it to. I think the only memoir I really re remember was Ally McGraw. Ally McGraw is really the only memoir that I can remember reading that I really loved. I didn't want to write, you know, I was born in such and such, and then this happened and this happened. and. Uh, the book came about in a very odd way to begin with, but no one's ever said that. Thank you. I thought you were going to say you've always put your children first, and which is which I have. But it's nice to know that that's what you got out of the book. Thank you. Before I ask you about some of your career highlights and your amazing books, I want to quote something that you wrote in your journal at the age of 18. You said, I have made my choice and am closing the door on an easy, good, normal, happy life. The road in front of me is only one of pain, nervous breakdowns, emptiness, and hollow success. So looking back, I would say that your life turned out way better than you predicted, don't you think? Well, I was only 18 <laughs> and a little pretentious, it sounds like to me now. I, <laughs> did I put that in a book? I must have, or you wouldn't have read it. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was, it, it, it wasn't pretentious, but it was, it Dramatic. seemed melancholy to me that you desperately wanted this career, but you were worried that it was going to make you unhappy, even if you were successful in it. Well, you were you know, only 18. I was only 18. <laughs> now, after graduating from high school, you entertained the American troops throughout Southeast Asia in a musical review called Showtime on Broadway. And then on February 7th, 1968, only three years and four and a half months after arriving in New York, you got into the chorus of Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. And seven months later, you landed the role of Tevye's second daughter, Hoddle. For someone who had a lot of trouble believing in your own talent, I think your career was meteoric compared to oh, most stars. Well, you know, these days, Harvey, I think young people go to New York and they've got a hit show like three months later. I, uh, I did a lot of summer stock, a lot of uh, touring, a lot of things. I, looking back on it, was not, I certainly wasn't as prepared as so many of the people that I was auditioning with. But I just, you know, I had given myself a, a timeline. I, I said to myself, if nothing happens by the time I'm 25, I'll go back to college and get my degree and I'll teach. And fortunately, I was younger than 25 when I, well, I mean, I got my equity card after about eight months after I had been in New York. And then from then on, I was earning a living as an actor, and that's, I didn't even know you could do that when I was growing up, and I never, you know, actors, you, you, that's, that's a profession, 
it was uh, it was just a joy, you know. So I was very fortunate. Well, you wrote that you had a lot of difficulty early on in your career, believing that you actually were talented. You didn't think you could sing well, even though you were in productions of The Pajama Game, Half a Sixpence, The King and I, and of course, Fiddler on the Roof. Do you think it's possible? This is my impression when I read your book. I think your insecurity came not from thinking you weren't talented enough, but from worrying whether it would ever pay off in terms of getting you a real long-term career. Actually, where it really came from is I studied singing when I was young, in you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, you know, so there was a right way to do it and all of that. And when I went to New York, I started working with a classical music teacher singing Italian arias and everything. And I saw this woman, I think I saw her twice a week for at least a year or two years. And twice a week, she kept telling me my voice had been damaged and that there was this, you know, this problem with my voice in a certain spot. And well, you hear somebody tell you your voice has been damaged twice a week for a year or so, and you don't think you can sing. I had been in Fiddler for a while, and I was playing Tevye's second daughter, and Bette Midler was playing Zeitl. And one night, somebody came backstage to see Bette, just as I was leaving. And he said to me, oh, your song was beautiful. You have a beautiful voice or something. And I said, oh, thank you very much. And I walked out and I thought, well, why did he say that? He doesn't know me. He didn't have to say that, you know? And then I started, you know, mentally going through, well, wait, Adrian, do you think they hired you out of the kindness of their heart? I mean, maybe, maybe you can do this, you know, but it came from the outside in. It came from being told, you know, there's something wrong. You can't, you're not doing this as, as well. And, and I mean, I've, I've overcome it. I sure um, hope so. You know, <laughs> it's like, now, in Fiddler, you shared a dressing room with Bette Midler. As you mentioned, she played Seidel. You described her as brilliant and single-minded. Yes. Could you tell even then that she was destined for greatness? Yes. Yes. There was no question in my mind. I, I was fortunate enough when I went into the show, Bette was already doing, doing the role. And so I sat in the balcony for two weeks watching the show every night and she was brilliant. She just, she brought me to tears every night, the scene where she's begging Papa to let her marry Mottle the tailor. And then when she started working on the Divine Miss M on her, on her, her club act, there was a, yes, a single mindedness. She knew what she was needed to do and she did it. And there was no question in my mind that she would be, you know, enormous, what she has become what she became very early on. I love the fact that many years after doing Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway, you did another production. I think it was in Pittsburgh and played Golda. That's so cool. <laughs> I've done several. I've played Golda three times now. I did it in Sacramento and I did it in Pittsburgh and I did it here in, in LA or down in Long Beach. Yeah. And, you know, if I stick around another 10 years, I can play Grandma title. <laughs> And in 1972, you starred as Rizzo in the original Broadway production of Grease, which was a major turning point in your life. You got a Tony Award nomination, you won a Theater World Award, and Jack Kroll's review in Time magazine led to Norman Lear calling you in to read for Maud. Adrienne, you must have been over the moon when that happened. You know, <laughs> again, I mean... I didn't know anything about television and I didn't know anything about Norman Lear. And I mean, I've been working on stage since I was 15. And so I don't know, they just, they, I had an agent by that time. I never had an agent the entire time I was in New York until after the Tony Awards, but I had an agent and I guess they must have, uh, you know, called and said, we've got an appointment for you to meet with this Broadway producer, I mean, this LA producer, Norman Lear, and he's got a and so I went in and met with Norman, and, and the role had already been established in the pilot episode that they did for B as having a seven-year-old son, and they were replacing the actress who had, who had done the role. She didn't want to move to L.A. and 
for whatever reasons. And so I went in to meet with Norman and then I heard, you know, oh, it was a great meeting, but he doesn't think you look old enough to have had a seven-year-old son. I go, okay, fine, I'll go back and do Greece. You know, I mean, I've got, I've got a fantastic job. And then about a month later, they called and asked me to fly to LA and audition because they hadn't been able to find what they wanted. But I, because I didn't know television, I didn't realize until later how, how incredibly lucky I was and fortunate and not only to have been cast, but to have been cast in that show with those people and that, that producer, Norman. And it was, uh, it, it was again, life-changing. And how lucky for us that we got to know you. But I'm trying to imagine, I mean, there you are, you played Carol Trainer, Maud's daughter for six years from 72 to 78. I'm trying to imagine you on the set when the show started. There you are with B. Arthur, Bill Macy, Esther Roll, Conrad Bain. They're all 20 years older than you with way more experience in the theater. How intimidating was that? Incredibly, incredibly intimidating. I still remember, and I don't remember much about my career, but I still remember the first week of rehearsal, there was a scene where I had to hold a teacup or, or, or I, I was buttering bread or something. I had a, a, an implement, a utensil, a knife or a fork or something. I had to hold a teacup. And um, the director said over the loudspeaker, what's that noise? What's that noise? I was so nervous that the, 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 <laughs> I was knocking the, tea, the teacup with the spoon. And, you know, I was so nervous. And again, I thought, I, you know, I, I, they're all more talented than I am. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, had it been anyone other than Norman, I think I probably would have been let go. Certainly in this day and age, when you show up for a table read and if you don't get every joke on the first day, you know, without any rehearsal, they're going to replace you. But Norman just, he said to me, you know, if you don't trust yourself to know you're good, trust me because I know you're good and just relax and have a good time and do the work. And eventually I did. <laughs> well, what's really amazing to me, Adrienne, about your performance in Maud is that your prior experience was in Broadway musicals. You never yeah. set out to be a comic actress, as I understood it. Is it true that doing comedy is a lot more difficult than drama? I don't know about that. It wasn't so much the difference of comedy and drama as it was the medium. I was used to working on stage, you know, big. <laughs> I mean, Rizzo was big, you know. <laughs> and uh, it took me a while to understand that when you're working for the television camera, and even more so when you're working for the film camera, you bring it down, you know? And uh, so that was more, doing the comedy, I mean, I, God, I was working with such incredible comedians and comedians that uh, I think I learned pretty quickly timing and things like that. And of course, musical comedy, you're, you know, you're going for, you're, there are laughs there, there are laughs there. So it wasn't so much a difference. I don't, I mean, and, and to this day and age, there's no difference at all to me for either doing comedy or drama. It's really the difference in the mediums. When I look back at some of the socially significant issues that were dealt with on Maud, for example, abortion, mental illness, cosmetic surgery, malpractice, gay rights. Manic depression. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But look at the two part episode about abortion and the importance of the pro choice issue, given what you saw women go through in the 60s. Isn't it shocking that after all these years, the issue of abortion is still so controversial? It's it's way more than shocking. It's it's very disturbing. It's very disturbing to see what's happening in, uh, you know, in Texas and, and in other states now and in the courts. It's, it's, it's jaw dropping. It's frightening. It's jaw dropping. It's, it's hard to believe. I want to ask you about B. Arthur. You said she was the consummate professional with great timing and delivery, and she was nothing like the mod character. Was she more like Dorothy, the character she played on Golden Girls? 
you know, I never watched Golden Girls. I don't know that character at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're too busy working. <laughs> it's like, I'm not a big comedy, TV comedy fan <laughs> to begin with. I'm usually watching MHZ Choice and Scandinavian Mysteries and Italian Police Procedures and things like that. So I never did, I never saw Golden Girls. I don't know what that her character was there. I guess I always just assumed she was sort of like Maud, but maybe she wasn't. But B, I guess you could say she was like Maud in that if she cared deeply about something, she spoke her mind. But she was not a firebrand or anything like that. Uh, she wasn't domineering? She wasn't domineering. She was very giving. She was very loving. She was a homebody, you know. She wasn't out in the, in the social scene. I'm sure she cared, uh, you know, she had an ego, but what was more important to her was the quality of the show and whatever would make the show best, not what would make B look best, you know. She was... She was a team player. She was a team player. She was incredibly professional, mostly so just giving. And as an actor, I mean, and I've learned this from years of guest starring on other series where you're walking into a room and all these people have been together for a long time. And, you know, some of them don't even want to be there anymore. And you're the new person and you just sit down and you say your lines and blah, blah, blah. B, if... As soon as a guest artist came in, whether they were a day player with under five lines or whether they were, you know, a name actor, B was the first one up from the table to go and greet them and bring them into the room and introduce herself to them and introduce everybody else to them. And uh, she was just... That's really classy. She was, she was classy. She was classy. Now, you said something interesting about Norman Lear in your book. You said... He didn't always write great comedy, but he rewrote great comedy. Yes. What did yes. you mean by that? Yes. Well, you know, that's probably something I heard from other people as well. But Norman usually came in. Um, we had a staff of writers, some incredible writers. Well, Schiller and Weisskopf, Bob Schiller and Bob Weisskopf, and uh, Charlie Houck, and uh, so many, Thad Mumford. And, and uh, so... And, and oftentimes we would get scripts from the writing community, not from our writing staff. I think the abortion episodes were written by Susan Harris, who was not on our staff, but who submitted the, 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 the two writing things. So they would have written the first draft. Norman would come in for the table read and he'd know exactly why that joke didn't work or that that joke needed to go over there or that this joke would be better if so-and-so said it, that kind of thing. He didn't always write them from scratch, but he sure knew how to rewrite them. He sure did. In 1979, you made your first feature film, The Fog, which is a classic horror movie written and directed by your husband at the time, John Carpenter. I think that because of your role in Maud, People thought you would be making films about important social justice issues, but there you were in a horror movie. Is it true that you like making horror movies, but you don't like watching them? That's very true. That's very true. I had never <laughs> even seen a horror film. I've still never seen Psycho, but I'd never seen a horror film until John and I got engaged and he took me to see a screening of Halloween. And then I never wanted to see another one again. <laughs> you know? I mean, I think he was black and blue for me. Oh my God, you know, hitting him and all of that. I love doing them, but I don't like being scared. I have a very strong fright reaction, I guess you'd call it. I mean, I'll be sitting in my office and one of my kids will come to the door and I'll scream because I didn't hear him and I didn't expect him there. <laughs> it's like, oh! Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm always saying I'm sorry. Well, as long as you keep making them, we'll keep watching them. Well, I just, I have another one that was just released in this last two or three months. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be a, a theatrical release, but 
because of COVID, you know, we were, they were just getting ready to release it right before the pandemic, but now it is on all the streaming services. I think it's on Amazon Prime called Unearth and uh, with Mark Lucas. And it is sort of, actually it is a socially significant horror film. It's about fracking and the horror that is, uh, that might ensue when we start messing with mother earth. And I just did an episode of American Horror Story, uh, you know, but I mean, they're fun to do. I just don't want to watch them. Oh, I get it. I, I want to ask you about Cannonball Run. You got to work with Burt Reynolds, Roger Moore, Jackie Chan, Dean Martin, Dom DeLuise, Sammy Davis Jr., a whole bunch more. Your description of that film shoot sounds like it was chaotic, disorganized, frankly, unprofessional. And on top of all of that, Heidi Von Belts was paralyzed in an accident. What I want to know is, does it feel weird to have people tell you how much they enjoyed the film when your experience making it was not a positive one? It doesn't feel weird. As I started the chapter in the book, you know, didn't you have a great time making Cannonball Run? That's the story. That's the question everyone asks me. And my experience was not the experience that everybody has when they're watching it. Let, let me just put it that way. It was, for several reasons, not, not my favorite film to do, you know, and not my favorite film to watch either. If you look at the outtakes right at the end where Bert is slapping Dom and everybody else is laughing hysterically. And when the camera pans over to my character, uh, you'll see how I felt. <laughs> Yeah. But it was great working with it was great working with Dom and working with Roger Moore, who I was, you know, I was starstruck. And Dean was fantastic. And uh, I knew Bert. I had known Bert for a long time. So uh, and I knew Sammy. So, I mean, there were good things about it, but it wasn't a, it wasn't as happy an experience for me making it as it is for most of the people who see it, who just love it. So. Yeah, I got that. And I, I wondered if it felt weird when people say to you, oh, it was so great. No, I just, you know, I, I usually just say, read my book. You know? <laughs> and that's what we're telling all the viewers. If you want to know why Adrienne says that Cannonball Run was not a great shoot, read the book. Now, you played Lieutenant Cable in Swamp Thing, directed by Wes Craven, and you wrote that the film shoot was your worst work experience since your days as a go-go dancer. Were you surprised when the movie got great reviews and became a cult classic? I was a little surprised because when I first saw the, the uh, when I first read the screenplay, I just thought it was wonderful. And I thought it could be a huge hit and, and just really make a lot of people happy. It was a wonderful screenplay, sort of a Beauty and the Beast. When I saw the completed film, I was disappointed because... Wes had done the best, very best he could, but the studio had pulled the financial rug out from under him at every turn. And so he had to make enormous changes in the script, throughout characters. He just, it was just an impossible situation for him. And so I watched it and I thought, oh, I knew what it could be. And I didn't think it had quite gotten there. And then Ebert and Siskel came out and said, you know, it's this undiscovered gem. And I thought, well, who am I? <laughs> you know, what do I know? And Well, that that's is- because none of us know what it could have been. But what yeah. we see looked fabulous. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> now, when you wrote your first book in 2006, you said that your favorite role was Billy in Creepshow because she was a total bitch, a loud, vicious, nasty, drunk, is that still your favorite role? She's one of them. She's one of them. I mean, I love Ruthie and Carnival. And of course, I love Stevie Wayne and, uh, and Maggie and Escape from New York. But Billy, <laughs> just because she's, she just makes me laugh. <laughs> she's, she's a, she was fun to do. I, I have to tell you this. There's a chapter in your book about th- describing the planning for your wedding to Billy Van Zandt. That's absolutely hilarious. I'm telling the viewers that chapter alone is definitely worth the price of the book. I'm so glad that two of you have remained friends because you sure had a lot of fun together. 
Yes, we did. We did. And, and we still do. He comes over and walks the dogs and, you know, I get together with him and his new wife. He and Teresa Ganzel just got married. So, uh, well, yeah. one reason I'm so happy that you did have that partnership with Billy is because in 2006, you starred as Judy Garland in Billy's off-Broadway play, The Property Known as Judy Garland, which takes place backstage in Copenhagen at Judy's last concert. I would have done anything to see that performance. I hear you were fabulous in it. And I wondered what your reaction was when you watched, if you watched, Renee Zellweger play Judy Garland uh, in the same part of her life. I never saw it. <laughs> I didn't see it. I'm not a big movie goer. <laughs> Okay, so we know you don't watch comedies on TV. <laughs> and you, don't, you don't go to the movies. Well, that sounds like you're pretty healthy. Well, <laughs> most of what I see now, I'm seeing because I am video captioning it for the blind, which is something that I do when I'm not on a set. So I do see more horror films than I would, would see if, if I weren't doing this job. But... I did not see, I did not see uh, Renee Zellweger play Judy Garland. You played Ruthie, the sensual, powerful, vulnerable, and blind snake dancer in the HBO hit series Carnival. How in the world did you learn to deal with those snakes? You know, the snakes didn't, they didn't give me any trouble at all. I, I went to, as you can only find in Los Angeles, a snake dancer <laughs> who had a whole bedroom full of snakes. And uh, she basically taught me that if you're going to dance with a snake, the snake is going to do the choreography. <laughs> so <laughs> you just follow him around. <laughs> and I became quite fond of them <laughs> by the time we had finished, even though they insisted on uh, depositing their monthly meal on my costume every time we started working together. But... Uh, I didn't have it. The only thing I couldn't work with, I've worked with tarantulas, I've worked with bees, I've worked with rats, I've worked with snakes. I couldn't have done E.G. Marshall's role in Creepshow. I would not work with cockroaches. I just, I can't stand cockroaches. Okay. <laughs> or Jerusalem crickets. Those are the only two, potato bugs. <laughs> well, I almost lost it when I read that you said that being in Carnival was the perfect job. Why? Oh, for so many reasons. In the first place, I love the words. I love the character. It was 30 miles away from my house, so I could, and there were so many of us in the cast that none of, you know, I never worked maybe more than four days a week at the most, usually three days a week. So I could drop my kids off at school most days or pick them up from school on my way home. The, the writing staff was fantastic. The caterers were fantastic. The other actors were fantastic. And, you know, for a woman of my age at that time to be able to play a character like that, when most women's roles for that age are, you know, the judge or the nurse or the lawyer, maybe, it was just, it was, it was just great. It was, it was, and I, and I liked the philosophy of the show as well, uh, the metaphysical aspects of the show. Uh, I think had we had one more season, we really would have been a huge success. We were just finding the crossover audience, but it was, an expensive, it was an expensive show to produce and HBO had just come off of Sopranos numbers and they wanted a massive audience. And uh, so we got canceled. Well, the seasons that you did produce are pretty spectacular, I think. I like I, it. I, I do, too. I do, too. <laughs> now, you were the voice of Catwoman in Batman the Animated Series, and you were Mrs. Simone in Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, and you were Scooter's mom in Fly Me to the Moon. I loved that. Did you like voiceover work as much as acting in front of the camera? Yes, I do. I do. I've done a lot since, you know, American Dad and... A lot of a, a lot of video games. I do a lot of video games. And as I said, I, I do the video captioning for the blind. I mean, the great thing about voiceover work is you don't have to get made up and you don't have to worry about costumes and, and uh, you know, and it's fun. It's and, and it can be a challenge, but it's it's really just fun. 
it sounds like a lot of fun. You started a musical review by Kander and Ebb called And the World Goes Round. You had to sing in German, play the banjo, and tap dance on roller skates, and you were breastfeeding twins at the time. I was nursing the twins. Is there, yeah. is Plus, there we were any... rehearsing in Long Beach, and I had one twin who just got hysterical whenever I put him into a car seat. So I'm driving for an hour and 20 minutes down to Long Beach with this boy just, just screaming his head off. And I'd stop at the side of the road and I'd get in the back and I'd nurse him and he'd calm down and I'd put him back in the chair and then he'd go crazy. Okay, Adrienne, let's talk about your books, Vampires of Hollywood, Love Bites and Make Me Dead, which I would describe as comedic romance thrillers. What, <laughs> is, what inspired yeah. your interest in vampires? Nothing at all. I'll tell you, this is another story. After my memoir came out, I was approached by an Irish author who was very prolific in the UK and in Ireland. He'd written many, many books, of horror, film, horror books and science fiction and romance and all of that. And he said, you know, the memoir was a great book, but it's the wrong book. You should have written a book for your horror genre fans you know it would be a huge seller at the conventions and all of that and i said well i don't know i mean i knew the story of the memoir you know i don't think i'm a storyteller i don't know if you know a, a plot person and he said well i'll help you so we sat down and he said okay what do you want to you know you want to be like this you want to be like this and i said all right well let's keep her close to me so we made her a uh, a 450 year old Armenian vampire who is a scream queen and the head of a small film studio in Los Angeles and the star of 17 blockbuster horror films and a couple that just went straight to DVD. Avsana Moore. <laughs> Avsana Moore, yes. And she is also the Chatelaine, the leader of the Vampires of Hollywood, which includes many, many A list actors. Orson Welles and Mary Pickford and Robert Downey Jr. and, and some who are getting knocked off. Uh, so that was the premise for Vampires of Hollywood. It opens with one of the A-list Hollywood actors <laughs> getting into his limo or being found in his limo after the Academy Awards with his Academy Award shoved where the sun don't shine. <laughs> And so it's up to Avsana and the hunky Beverly Hills detective that she that is investigating these murders to find out who is killing off the vampires of Hollywood. We wrote a proposal for that one with six chapters and we submitted it to St. Martin's Press and they came back and said, we want two. So we wrote the first one, Vampires of Hollywood. And then my co-author sort of disappeared. He got busy with other things. So I wrote the second one, which is Make Me Dead, which can be read as a standalone. It's, you don't have to read the first one. And, uh, and then my publisher came back and said, we need a third one for the trilogy. Uh, we'll just release that. We released that one just as an ebook for Kindle. And, and that's Make Me Dead. And that takes place in a, uh, a horror convention. <laughs> But the second one, Love Bites, I was then approached by a producer, director uh, in Los Angeles who asked if he could option it and then came back and asked if we could co-write the screenplay. I never in my life thought I would write a screenplay because I didn't understand it at all. But uh, we did. And we've just written the pilot for a series and we're in the process of... Uh, seeing if somebody wants to make it that so, is so exciting we'll I mean, see you know that and 50 cents is going to get you on a subway maybe it's a dollar now but uh, you never know if somebody we'll had see, told we'll you see. when you were writing that diary when you were 18 that you would have written four books with the career you've had you wouldn't never. have believed that either never i never i never ever thought that i would write anything that anybody would ever read. And it was only, as you know, since you read the memoir, it was only because I ended up, in my mind, getting a message from my closest friend who had passed away, uh, but who sent me a message and told me I had to go take a writing class. And so I thought, well, 
you know, this is Suzanne taking me, telling me to take a writing class. And so I started taking a writing class for no other reason. And that led to the books. So, and now I've just finished. I didn't write this one. I edited it, did some writing myself, but I have two co-editors and we have just turned in the final draft to Chicago Review Press. It is a compilation of stories written by all of the actors who appeared on Broadway in Greece and in the touring companies, in the bus and truck companies. Some famous names that you'll know, John Travolta and uh, Mary Lou Henner and Patrick Swayze and, uh, you know, Treat Williams and uh, some others that you will not. About a year and a couple of months ago, we had a Zoom reunion right at the beginning of the pandemic of the original cast of the Broadway show. And we spent four and a half hours telling stories about our, you know, how we auditioned or you know, what happened backstage and this and that. And they were so funny and moving and unheard. I had never heard met most of these stories that when we hung up, I thought, you know, this is a book. I mean, people would love to read these stories. So um, I love I the fact that the title is Greece. Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. Yes. So I contacted everybody that had been at the Zoom meeting. And then uh, the director, Tom Moore, our, the original director of Greece, called me immediately and said, I've had this idea for a long time, you know, but it should be this and this and this, not what you're saying. And I said, fine, go ahead and write it. And he said, no, 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 we have to do it together. So we brought Ken Waisman on, who was our producer of Greece, And then we solicited stories from all the actors. And it's, it's quite a wonderful, it's, it's, it's funny and it's interesting and it's touching in many ways. And, um, and it's a piece yeah. of history. You it know, is a piece of history. And we've got 250 photographs in there. And uh, I mean, if so that wasn't history, made, the, the, there would, that would be lost. All those stories would be lost. Yes. Yeah. We're hoping to have it. It'll be released next summer. We didn't get it under the wire for the uh, 50th anniversary for, for Greece, but we will have it out next summer, which is the 50th anniversary year of Greece. And, um, and the all proceeds, the proceeds are going to the Actors Fund. Actors Fund, yes. Oh, when the yeah. book comes out, Adrienne, I hope I can convince you to come back and uh, we'll promote oh, it. Definitely, definitely. Well, <laughs> I have one last question for you. Okay. You wrote in your first book that you believe in your power to manifest the things you want in life. Now, you wrote that in 2006. Have you been able to get everything that you wanted? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I was just thinking about the future. Harvey, I have been able to raise three wonderful young men that I love more than life itself. I have been able to support myself doing something I love for my entire life. I've never had to step away and, and you know, since I left the Fraboni termite control in San Jose in 1963, working as a, an office manager, I have been, a, well, no, I did then end up being a discotheque dancer for a while. But since I started working consistently as an actor, I, uh, you know, and that's all I ever wanted. I didn't, to just be able to do what I love for a career, how, how, how lucky is that, you know? And, and take care of my kids. So, yeah. Do you think that you appreciate how popular and beloved you are? You know, it was only in the last couple of years that people started saying, oh, she's a horror icon. And I thought, what? You know? See, I see you as so much more than a horror icon because you've done so much there's such a breadth and a depth of performances in your body of work it's very layered it's textured it's complex i just wondered whether you realize because a lot of celebrities are so insulated they don't ever really hear from ordinary fans like me 
telling you that you're really beloved. I hope you know that. Thank you, first of all, for saying that. I think that when it's all over, I hope that people will say, oh, she did, she did a lot of stuff that I really enjoyed watching, you know? It's one of the, the nice things about doing the horror conventions or the autograph conventions is because you realize from what people are saying that some of the, the things that you did had, a, had an impact on them. I still have people come up to me and say, you know, the character that you played on Maud was my role model for how to be a woman in those days. I didn't know. And I, and I still remember one young man who came up and said, that show taught me that people could be in a family and love each other and still yell and scream at each other because I didn't know that. All I knew was the yelling and screaming. I didn't know that anybody could still love somebody, you know? And, and so things like that. I had one, one young man come up. This was maybe five or six years ago. Uh, my boys were playing soccer and he came up and he said, and I don't even remember the name of the character, but he said, you played Mrs. Somebody in the Wayans Brothers. You saved my life. And I said, what? He had been in a very bad auto accident. They didn't expect him to live. He was in the hospital and he woke up every morning and, and said, if I, and he was a big Wayans Brothers fan, that, that series. And he said, if I can just make it through the day until the Wayans Brothers comes on, you know, then maybe I can, I can make it through another couple of days and my episode came on or something. And, and in his mind, you know, I, I, was, I had helped give him the emotional strength, I guess, to, to hang on. And so that's the great part about being in this milieu, I guess, and being in this entertainment field. Well, Adrian, I'm glad that you do get that feedback because I have to tell you, having you on our show has been a dream come true for me. You're one of the most hardworking and gifted actresses of our generation. It's been a huge honor to interview you. And I'm glad that you do understand that you've touched many people's lives. You taught women how to be a daughter. You taught women how to be a mom. And of course, you taught us all how to dance with snakes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So thank and you. If you. And if you read my book, you'll learn how to deal with rats. <laughs> yes, for sure. Thank you so much for taking the thank time to you. come on our show. Thank you. Please come back anytime to talk about any of your projects. You're always welcome. I will. We'll come back and we'll talk about Greece. I also have a Cowboy Bebop coming up. I just I did a guest star on Cowboy Bebop for Netflix. And you know, I, there's a, another show that I hope your, your audience can watch because I thought it was really lovely. I did just one episode of AJ and the Queen with RuPaul on Netflix, but I really liked that character. Oh, I can't wait to see that. She was a survivor and I really liked her. So, okay. Thank you so, so much. Our guest has been the incomparable actress and author, Adrienne Barbeau. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.